Hello, everybody. Randy Patterson here with Boomerosity. Thanks for joining us. If you recall about a year and a half ago, it had been around November, December of uh, 2021, I interviewed Bruce Coburn for the first time, and it was a personal thrill for me because I remember when the album Dancing in the Lion's Jaws came out, and of course there was that hit song from that album, Wondering Where the Lions Are, and I loved that album. I was actually working in a Christian bookstore at the time when that album came out, and it was one of the most sought-after albums at that time. Uh, Bruce Coburn was the artist, and he was looked at maybe accurately, maybe somewhat inaccurately as a crossover artist from secular music into contemporary Christian music. Um, I just think he was a spiritual man who happened to sing some songs that had some spirituality in there, some Bible-based uh, spirituality, and some people wanted to lump him in there. I think if you talk to Bruce, he'll probably tell you as much. But what a phenomenal artist he was then and still is today. In fact, he's got a brand new album out called O oh Sun, O oh Moon. And it is a phenomenal album. I think you're really going to love it if you're a Bruce Coburn fan, especially. So I got to talk to Bruce for a second time. And we talked about the album. We talked about uh, what has transpired since the last time we talked, especially about the results of the tour that he was undergoing or about to start. When we talked the last time, it was a 50 year anniversary tour that he was doing. So we caught up on those things, but really talked a lot about the album. And so uh, I think you're going to love the interview. I ask that if you would, please like it on your YouTube channel or on the podcast, depending where you're um, enjoying this interview from. I ask that you subscribe, share it with your friends and just keep on watching and following Boomerosity. So until next time, this is Randy Patterson with Boomerosity. Take care. Hello, Bruce. How you doing? Too bad. How are you? Well, hanging in there. <laughs> That's what we can hope for. Yeah. As long as we're breathing and above ground and uh, not fighting off too much of anything, I guess we should be grateful, right? I would say yes. That's a good way. To... <laughs> Where are you dialing in from? San Francisco. Oh, San Francisco. Okay. All right. Good deal. Well, listen, it's been about a year and a half since we last spoke. Uh, we talked about your 50 year anniversary tour. And mm -hmm. uh, how did that go, by the way? Was it, were you satisfied with the results? Yes, I thought it went very well, actually. Um, it, it dragged on, kind of. I mean, it, it became a little bit of a stretch to think of it as the 50th anniversary tour after a while. But, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, yeah, it's, uh, I think. Now that the new album is about to come out, I think we can call it officially over, and it was good. It was, I, I was really happy with the, the reception I got, and and um, that you know people came out to the shows. It, it was just like what you want. Great, great. Did you notice? I mean, that's that's probably the first time you've been out on any kind of real tour since the pandemic. Did you notice any changes in the crowd, or how things went, or anything market markedly different? It was really noticeable at first. <clears throat> and um, I guess when did we actually start doing this? It was 2022. It was the end of 20 of uh, the end of 2021. I guess that we actually really started doing the 50th anniversary thing, mm -hmm. if I remember right. I'm, I'm not sure I do, mm -hmm. but but uh, anyway, the, uh, in the beginning, you there was a real, very noticeable sense of uh, kind of escape from confinement on the, on the part of the people. Uh, I mean, I felt it, everybody did. And, and it really made for a great vibe in the, at the shows because people were so happy to be there. And yeah. Almost didn't matter who was on stage. It was just like, look at us all. We're all in the same room at the same time. Wow. You know? And, and so, yeah, it, it, that's it. That was really a characteristic of almost all the shows in the, for the first little uh, first few months of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, as time went on, it, it, that sort of faded a bit because people were more used to being out. Yeah. But uh, but it was good, good all around. I, um, in the beginning, of course, all the theaters were very conscious of masking and having verifying that you had your shots and all that stuff. And um, that also faded with the passage of time, you know, so just it, nobody was forgetting about it, but but um, you, you could see, you could really see how we were all kind of getting used to not living that way again. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I know. I think when we talked last time, I can't, I didn't go back and listen to our last interview, but I may have mentioned at that time, because it would have been around that time that uh, I was noticing how each city in, in Tennessee, where I live, was behaving differently from one big town. to another. I mean, I figured Nashville would be much like San Francisco and be very uptight uh, when I went to go see Eric Clapton in concert. I didn't see a mask almost anywhere. And that wasn't because of Eric and his stance. It was, I mean, that wouldn't have mattered in that town. People were just not wearing them, but yet I'd go to Chattanooga and probably about half the crowd was wearing them. So it's, you know, two hour difference and in driving time. And that's what I ran into. It was kind of interesting. Yeah. We noticed that the first part of that, of that tour <clears throat> went up the West coast from, from the Bay area. And uh, you really, you know, when you hit Oregon, it, people were far less concerned. <laughs> but then once you got to Washington, they were concerned again. You know, <laughs> and I mean, it's just like <laughs> there were I mean, there was some, you know, the 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 crews were were being careful at, at all the theaters we played. You know, like the backstage crews yeah. were it, wanted us to be masked as much as possible, and they were. Uh, but, um, but nobody else seemed to worry about it too much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Hopefully we don't ever have to experience anything like this again in our lifetime. That's, uh, yeah, well, I guess it depends on how long our lifetime, <laughs> we're, how long a lifetime we're expecting to have. I, I, I personally, I mean, I, I'm with you. I hope we don't, but I think we will Yeah. because uh, the stuff is out there and we're not, you know, the, the world's not getting any simpler. No, it's not. It's really not. Well, man, I love your new album, Oh Sun, Oh Moon. I, I mean, wow. I think you've hit that one out of the park, man. It, it's, I'm, I'm, Thank that's an exciting good. album. Tell me about it. What's the story behind getting this album together and, you know, how long it take to put it together, <laughs> things like that? Well, the actual recording took a month mm -hmm. and then, and, and another week to mix it, basically. Um, the better part of a month anyway. The, the lead up, the, of course, the period of time that the songs were being written was the period of time since, uh, well, I, I mean, sort of since Bone on Bone in a way because of the album in between didn't have any lyrics. But uh, but really it's since Growing Ignites pretty much that, that these songs were written. So they reflect the time period that we've all been living through. And uh, my, you know, the way it's impacted me and 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 my reactions to that um that's that's sort of typical but in this case they are a product of covid a product of the the uh increasing um fragmentation of society of, of american society in particular um and uh and you know there's and a lot of spiritual stuff that's kind of always in there and mm -hmm. and uh, uh an actual love song or two so <laughs> they still come out at almost any of our ages right so <laughs> yeah yeah are they are, are love songs easier for you to write now uh than say 20 30 40 years ago no um nothing's easier actually uh <laughs> I, I, I did a test of that. Every, everything it gets harder, but yeah. it, but uh, no, it, it's it, it, uh, for me. Love songs of they kind of have to. I, I I can't invent them. Like I mean, I'm not good at inventing anything. I I have to be kind of. I have to get a brilliant idea, quote unquote, and then I kind of run with it and chase it down. But uh, the that kind of thing will happen when you're newly in love with somebody or when you're. Uh, and breaking up with somebody, and you get the you know the the poignant breakup song, etc. Et but um, if, when life is going on in a kind of a cool way and it's just flowing along, there's not that much impetus to write personal stuff. Uh, um, for me, uh, other other than the spiritual kind of things that come because these little flashes come now and then, and and you suddenly realize something that you didn't realize before can also have that happen with a person right. and uh and then a love song or something like it might come out so um but the the 
this the love song on this uh, um, push come to shove is just really um, it's a it, it's the product of a long term relationship that's working fine, you know, and <laughs> it's not it's uh, there's there's it's not really dramatic, it's kind of like the state state of the union, so to speak. <laughs> Spendios and everything, right? So, <laughs> were there when you were working on this album, or even writing the songs for it? Were there was there anything that happened, you know, from from conception to completion that came as a surprise to you? I mean, you've worked on a lot of albums over the years and written countless songs, but was there anything that surprised you in this whole process for this album? Actually, a lot. Uh, like they. I mean, it's all the same kind of thing, but the way we recorded the album, Gary Craig, who, who plays drums and or percussion and on, on all the, pretty much all the tracks, not all, but he and I recorded all the songs as a duo, more or less. Hmm. And then this was Colin's idea, and, and I, I, went, I liked it. Colin Linden, who produced the album. Mm -hmm. And um, so Gary and I, we, we did it all at Colin's studio in Nashville. And uh, we just spent, you know, a, cu a couple of weeks or a week and a half or so recording the songs. And then people came in and put on more parts. So the, the interesting thing about that, I, I, I've done things like that before, but never quite as focused uh, or never quite as um, completely that way. So I, I got to sit back and, you know, having gotten the performances that I needed to get out of myself, I, I could sit back and listen and really appreciate what everybody else was bringing to it. And it was surprise after surprise after surprise because Jim Hope comes in and he, and he comes in with these incredible horn arrangements. And I didn't know him. I'd, I'd, I'd never heard of him before. Colin, of course, knew of him or knew, perhaps knew him. But this great guy, plays all these instruments and, and, and marimba, which is one of the reasons we invited him because I wanted the sound of marimba in some of the songs. And and he, he just came up with all this great stuff. And the same thing with, with Jeff Taylor, who plays accordion and, and dulciola on the album. Same thing. It's like this, okay, well, let's try this, let's try this. So how about Bandonian in that one? And and yeah, then because we can get those low notes and he, yeah, go for it. And, it's like I kept every time somebody would come up with something, it'd, it'd be like, I, I, it's like, wow, this is fantastic. It's, and then the guests, like uh, um, Alice and Russell and, and uh, um, Jenny Scheinman, Sarah Jaros, uh, Sean Colvin, they, they all brought stuff to it. The, uh, the, the McCrary sisters, McCrary sisters were a treat. I had never met them before and they were lovely people and, and they really came through and, and it's just, yeah, it was a wonderful experience. I, I was limited by the fact that I, I suffer from something called Meniere's disease, which is, the, it produces the occasional attack of vertigo, mm. um, which fortunately is, is usually pretty occasional. It can be very severe. But all through the, the recording process, it, it, I, I was dealing with this every day. So, uh, you know, it was, we kind of got away with getting my parts done. But then I'd, you know, be sitting there. The, the, so the only downer part of it was that I'd be waiting for the room to stop spinning all the time, you know, like, but, but, uh, but there were, the, there, there, there were, everybody was putting all this great music on, onto my songs. And so that, kind of offset the, the negative effects pretty well uh, seeing the mccrary sisters on there i i i um i love their work and they, they hear those voices come through amazing absolutely amazing it's um that was a pleasant surprise to me what was you know and, and and i i can't recall if i asked you this the last time but i asked this of a lot of artists who write their own music or you know even if they're recording someone else's um, I know I can't say what's your favorite song because, as we always say, we can't. It's like you know, picking your favorite kid, and we're not supposed to do that. Yeah, but pick the one you want will drown the rest. That's right. <laughs> so, but what would you point to on this album as a calling card for the whole 
for the whole album? Well, I, I actually do have a favorite song on the album at the moment, although that's subject to change moment by moment, I think. <laughs> but it's when the spirit walks in the room, I feel, feel quite, uh, I, I, it, it still gives me a little rush to sing that song. And it's like there's something, something happened there. <clears throat> um, previously, it might have been Orders. Uh, that's what yeah. I was going to say is Orders. That one really, that's challenging, very challenging. It's a well. It's yeah, something that was lying there waiting to be said. It seemed like, and and uh, but I've sung that one for audiences. There's a few of these songs that have been in the shows, uh, not all by far, but um, but that's one of them, and people responded very well to that um, that one, and and us all also. Yeah. But it's because uh, they just, I guess, I mean, everybody feels similarly to how I do, and in, in the and looking around at all this stuff and thinking it needs to be addressed. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, and I, 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 in mentioning all the people playing on the album, I, I left out Buddy Miller and I want to make sure that he gets mentioned because he, his voice is an important part of a couple of songs too. Absolutely. What you mentioned that uh, people like, you know, this, um, walking in the room, but what, what other feedback are you getting from crowds and friends and family who have heard some of the music from the album? Uh, the family's bored with it, you know, cause they hear it all the time. <laughs> the, uh, um, my wife says her favorite song is, is into the now. Hmm. Um, she also expressed, uh, you know, like a, a sort of, a typical amount of enthusiasm for when the spirit walks in the room when, when I first wrote it. Um, my daughter, you know, is far more interested in Ed Sheeran than in me, but, but, uh, um, although she respects what I do and she can, she does appreciate it, but she's a big Ed Sheeran fan. So I hear all about him and not so much about me, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, the people have, I mean, there's a, um, the only person who's heard all these songs is Mark Yahiro, who helped me make demos of them all and when we, when they were, as as they appeared, you know, so, um, and, um, you know, he's, he's always expressed enthusiasm for them too, but, it, you know, it's, you can't trust your friends on that, on that score very well, because they're, <laughs> unless they're, I mean, there are those kinds of friends who are going to go, oh, you know, that, that, I mean, people who really know what they're talking about. Another musician, maybe. But I don't have very many musician friends that I see all the time. So yeah. there's not there's not uh, that kind of back and forth, you know. You, you've always been a, a, a writer that was not afraid to touch on the spiritual aspect of life and such. In fact, I told you last time... Um, you know, I got turned on to you in 1980 when probably a big chunk of your fan base um, materialized, at least here in the States, you know, and seeing you on Saturday Night Live and all that. But do you find what do you, how do you what are you seeing as far as the receptivity to your to your spiritual messages in your song? Do you, have you ever seen it kind of come and go ebb and flow? Do you find people more receptive to it now, especially you know post pandemic and or maybe during pandemic and then waning now? What what's your what are you seeing in response to all that? It's a little too soon for me to know. I, in a way, I, I I mean with respect to the new songs anyway. But the um, I I don't know. I, I the, it certainly has waxed and waned over the years. I mean people's tolerance for that stuff and and interest in it. Um, and it's a lot of it had to do in the in the eighties and nineties. It had to do with what kind of songs were on the radio. <clears throat> that that's less of an issue now because none of my songs are on the radio except old. But <laughs> and nobody listens yeah, to the radio hopes, much anymore either. We have have high <laughs> hopes for this one, but but anyway, the 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 uh, um, the in the the people who were drawn into you know, what I do by the Stealing Fire album, for instance, or l less likely to be interested in the spiritual stuff and more concerned with the political side of things. Mm -hmm. um, but people who came in with 
you know, either earlier than that or later than that. Um, or it could be, it could go any which way. There were, um, and nowadays, I mean, Christianity is viewed with some suspicion in many circles for good reason. And, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, that's on the, on the, on the po political front. I mean, I don't think there's, I, I think people have made a terrible mistake in some areas with trying to put faith and politics together. But, um, I mean, your faith should inform your own personal choices. Absolutely. But it's not a political tool right. and it should never be. So um, that, that you know, um, I, I don't really know at this point, like whether how many people are, are skeptical because of what we see around us or and how many are, are out of what I have to say. I mean, personally, because lots of people are interested in all kinds of different approaches to spirituality, obviously. And I, you know, some of them come to my shows and they don't really care what labels are on it. They're interested in that side of things, but I, I don't have a good way to measure how much and who, you know, I see. The one thing I've noticed is that, you know, back when I first got turned on to you, you know, there was the whole moral majority movement. Uh, CCM was, you know, fastly approaching a, a billion dollar a year genre. Well, mm -hmm. you know, sub genre and then all the other genres under sub genres under it. And then now, though, I mean, when I look at it, I, I you know, I can't tell you that I listen to a lot, you know, I'm a believer. Um, some, some may question that sometimes, but I consider myself one, but it just doesn't seem like the CCM industry, music industry. And I think that's a great way of putting it. Now there's not that much, you know, it seems to be too be, being counter oriented like the rest of the music business, but it, there just seems to be such a huge difference now compared to early eighties when, you know, it was real, you know, he had Dylan out there doing his thing and, you know, others, it just seems like almost like the, the official genre seems to have almost all but gone away in my opinion. And I, I keep an eye on, I mean, I know that's overstating a bit, but is that what you're seeing? Do you see a, a like a big walking away from, what we might call contemporary Christian music? Well, you know, I mean, in the beginning, when that first became a phenomenon, I, I, I just wanted to run screaming. I, it's like, no, I'm not part of that. It, you know, because it was, it, the, the way in which things were being commercialized was exactly, as you just said, uh, kind of the same old picture that we were familiar with from the main, the, from secular uh, record companies. Mm -hmm. And um, it didn't, it seemed to me like, that that was the wrong way to go with with spirituality. Like mm -hmm. you can write any kind of songs you want. It's not about the, the styles of music particularly, but it becomes about that when the marketers have their say, and and you know then it all has to be this has to conform to this sort of stamp. And if you're not if you don't fit that, then we're not interested. That was too bad to see it go that way, mm -hmm. but not surprising. Yeah. Um, and but interestingly, and I, and I kind of just walked away from the whole thing. It's like I, I'm not there to me, with very few exceptions, and there were some. Uh, I thought there was a lot of crappy songwriting, and and um, you know everything was a like Christian hyphenated, you know, Christian punk and Christian metal and Christian said whatever else, and none of it was cutting edge. Right. Like, like none of it was none of it was breaking any ground. It was always like. Oh yeah, we play a metal music just like so and so and so and so, except we're Christians. Well, who will be, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I I just kind of stayed away from it. But when I started going to church here in San Francisco, uh, now ten years ago, probably, um, it I, it wasn't very long before I got pressed into service in the church band, but, you know, and. Then I had to learn all these songs that people were doing. So I'm watching YouTube videos of really good, great performances of some pretty good songs often. Not always, but but a lot of them were good and, and much better than, you know, they're still, they still fit that 
that mold. I mean, it, it was only a certain type of music that gets the exposure. Yeah. It seemed like, but within that, there was a range of, of those. You know, some of the people were more guitar oriented, some were more lyric oriented, some were, you know, more uh, thoughtful, some were just kind of gung ho worship song, and and it, it, I was actually happy to be exposed to all that stuff and to sort of be made to realize that, that it wasn't as bad as I imagined it was going to be. <laughs> In fact, some of it was just great. But, I but might now, need to listen to some of that then, because I... <laughs> COVID killed that, though, like, because it, for, for me, because the, you know, the church shut down. We mm -hmm. were doing virtual services, but the band shut down. The band disappeared. People moved away. There's, there was nothing, none of that left. So, so I haven't had the incentive or the necessity since then of kind of going and, and exploring that that music. Um, so that's that's been now what three or three years or so that I've been away from that, and I don't know what's going on out there now yeah, yeah. that way. But but I I think uh, I don't know. I, I I think if you start using whatever genre you're in or whatever job you have or whatever demographic you find yourself in if you start using that as a bludgeon <laughs> or or as a as a as a some sort of uh, distancing tool from your fellow human beings then i think that's a problem so the less we have to concern ourselves with these sorts of definitions the, the better in my view i i agree i agree so is there a tour coming up in support of this album? I think I know the answer to that. Yeah, there is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it starts at, it starts at the, um, the beginning of June. Mm -hmm. And it, it, so far, we're, actually, we're now booking shows for next April. Um, but uh, there's, a, there's some holes in there, of course. So I'm not doing any shows in July. There's some one Canadian show and three shows in Britain in August, and there'll be more touring in October in the States, in, in the Northeast. This, this tour that's about to start, starts in New England, it ends up in Atlanta, and it will bring us through Nashville yeah. um, later in June. Yeah. But, so I, I'm, I am looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to getting out and seeing what the reaction is to some of the songs that people haven't heard yet. I'm hoping to make it to that to, to the national show. It would be great. great to see you there. What's um what else is on your radar besides the album and the tour? You and you know everything tied to the album. What else? What do you what do you have planned for the rest of the year? Any other projects in the hopper or going uh, to the studio? Uh, no, no. Um, there's just some travel. I the. The, my, the big plan and the exciting plan at the moment of a non-touring sort is that that uh, my daughter, who's 11 now, uh, went to summer camp in Canada for the first, like, a real two-week sleepaway camp, you know, for, for the first time last summer. Mm. And she's going to go again this summer. And uh, where she goes is uh, in Ontario. And oh. we have a house up there. So she and I are going to drive there from San Francisco and and then my wife will fly up and meet us. She has to work through that period, but but we'll we'll just hang out and then then I'll be driving back. And I but I'm particularly looking forward to the drive with my daughter because she's covered the, the all of North America by road, but but on a tour bus in the dark. <laughs> so, so I've never really seen any of it. Yeah. And so you know it'll be fun to kind of shore stuff uh, uh, there's some beautiful scenery that you are obliged to go through to get from here to the east mm -hmm. so absolutely well speaking of ontario i i used to work for nortel which was a canadian company and you know headquartered near there in um brampton area i believe and and um but we just lost a great canadian treasure up there gordon lightfoot did you know gordon uh, have any experience with him or any thoughts about gordon I didn't know him well, <clears throat> but I'd met him many times. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, he, he was a giant. He was really 
more than anyone else. I mean, there were other people, me and Tyson, for example, um, Ian and Sylvia, uh, when I was starting out discovering folk music, discovering songwriting, I was, uh, I, uh, I had already had you know, considerable exposure to jazz before I got interested in that. But, but then when I did, it, it, you know, it was people like Lightfoot and, and actually not people like him, but him in particular you know, on the Canadian scene that would come through and we'd get, like, he was just mind blowingly good. Yeah. And it, it, good in a way that, because growing up Canadian, you, we, we were, I don't know if it's still true, it probably isn't, but uh, we were really convinced that nothing very good came out of Canada. You know, that <laughs> if, if it was gonna be good, it came from Britain or the US. And um, so to have that proven wrong by somebody that, just a guy from small town Ontario, like who'd have guessed? And there he was writing these great songs and playing well and singing beautifully. So uh, yeah, he made a big mark. And um, you know, it's like I, Bernie was saying that my manager uh, the other day, he was speculating as to whether or not Gordon would actually get a state funeral because he's that big a figure in the Canadian culture. Yep. Uh, so, you know, we don't know, of course, if that'll happen. Yeah. But uh, yeah. he would be worthy of it. Absolutely. I, I had the privilege of interviewing him one time and I saw him in concert in Chattanooga a few months later. He was supposed to be you know, doing the show a lot, like almost right after the interview, we did the interview by phone, um, it's pre COVID and, um, he had, he'd fallen and hurt his leg. And so there was two, po he had to postpone the original date. And then there were two more dates before he finally was able to make Chattanooga. And I was supposed to go backstage and meet him, but it didn't, um, he was just so beat by the, I mean, it, it was, you could tell he was really pushing hard and, you know, keeping himself in there, but you know how it is performing. You just kind of crash after you step out, out, out of that limelight. But his manager took my albums backstage to get signed by Gordon. So I have, I have it hanging in my office and prime location, man. I, I was really saddened when I heard that he passed that those, but 84 yeah. years old, man, that's a good run. Very he good. Did run. Have, he had a good run <clears throat> and, you know, and, I don't know anything about his his actual death. I, uh, you know, nobody, as far as I know, I haven't heard anything about that, that the circumstances of it or whatever. But uh, you know, it seemed not unexpected. I think he'd been sick for a while, and yeah. um, so you know, yeah, he just I canceled his tour like two weeks before, and there was right. no makeup dates or anything. It was like it's canceled. You can get your refund. I thought, eh, that doesn't sound good at all. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyway, well, thank you for your comments on that. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me again. And hopefully I can see you in a month or so in uh, in Nashville or one of the other stops, you know, along that tour. And if so, we can bump elbows and say hi to each other in person. So I would like that. I would too. So listen, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you down the road. Okay, Randy. You all the best to you. Thank Bye -bye. you.